Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. This is the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Now, today we are honored to be sitting down and speaking with the City of Portage La Prairie, Manitoba, Councillor Ryan Espy. The City of Portage La Prairie has small town charm with rich tapestry of history and natural beauty. Located along the Assiniboine River, the city is a harmonious blend of urban conveniences and rural tranquility. So stay tuned and we'll be right back after a quick message with cross-border interviews featuring Councillor Ryan Espy. Are you passionate about local governance and municipal issues? Do you believe in the power of community-driven conversations? Then join us at the Cross Border Network, where we bring together voices from across Canada to shine a spotlight on the challenges and the triumphs of our municipalities. But we need your support to keep the conversation going. Visit crossborderinterviews.ca today to show your support by backing the show monthly or making a one-time annual donation. Your contribution will help us grow and expand our reach, bringing important stories to even more listeners across the nation. Together, we can make a difference. Together, we can amplify the voices of local communities. Together, we can shape a brighter future for all. Cross Border Network, where local matters and your support counts. Visit us today at crossborderinterviews.ca. Councillor, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start by getting to know a little bit about the persona behind the councillor's title, if you don't mind. And I've got to ask the question I've asked every single person who's ever come on the show, so you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Ryan? Now, <laughs> I have, I've, I've prepared. So I've listened to this question get asked a few times on other other councillors that have been on your podcast, particularly from Portage La Prairie. And um, for me, I'm, I'm not a new councillor. I've been around. This is my fourth term. So I think back to that time when I was contemplating running for council back in 2010. And uh, at the time, there were some very contentious issues in our city. Um, you haven't seen those for a while. I mean, people still bring them up at election time, and a lot of people go go kind of blank when someone's trying to use that as a platform because people don't talk about it. But at the time, there was the multiplex that was built. So our great stride place arena was constructed with a pool with two ice surfaces, and it was expensive. And there was a lot of fundraising that was done, but it resulted in, I believe, an 11% tax increase over two years so when these councillors uh were done with this and it was a very long four years only one stayed around and there was kind of a mass exodus at the time i also was unhappy with some of the decisions that were being made in the city uh, i would learn later that there's rationale behind all of them however i thought i could do a good job and i've never been one to just complain without offering up to maybe do something about it or take action. So I decided to run for council and I had a, a lot of support. Had you considered running prior to 2010 or was that the first election after everything was going on with the sort of the decisions around the multiplex, around the tax increase, around some of the decisions that were being made? Had you considered prior to 2010 or was 2010 the, the final decision that you said, okay, it's time for Ryan to shut up or put up or shut up? Well, you know, four years earlier probably would have been too soon. If anything, it had crossed my mind, just a fleeting thought, if you will, that uh, kind of came and went. Um, but probably in 2008, I started thinking about it. And it was interesting because the former mayor who was a counselor from 2006 to 2010, Irvin Ferris, uh, was actually one of my mentors and one of my, uh, my actually direct supervisor at my job that I had which was working in Manitoba Corrections. So we had a we both had a provincial government job that we worked for. And he kind of would talk to me often about city issues. And I kind of took an interest that way as well. But I knew there was going to be a, an opening and I knew that uh, there was an opportunity there. So we ran and there were 16 people that ran for um, the six spots in council that uh, that election. So you have now been on council for 14 years. I can imagine the decisions you're making today are 
pretty much similar to what you were making uh, in 2010 in the first term, but there are different challenges that go along with it. What's been the biggest change in your mind about what the municipality is dealing with in 2024 compared to what they were dealing with in 2010? Well, that's a very interesting question because <laughs> aside from the direct multiplex construction, the challengers are very similar. It's managing the money coming in with the money going out and what priorities we're going to spend them on. Um, we have a lot of things that we've done and managed to do without any tax impact. Of course, the Saskatchewan Avenue project being one of them, but it's still being good stewards of the public money. And I have now worked with four completely different councils and the challenges we face now for me and my important issues are probably lessened a little bit this time around because I think the current council is more open to some of those things. And of course, I'm talking about like more uh, parks and social issues and that kind of stuff and how the city can impact those. So the job really doesn't change. We've been talking about nutrient removal and wastewater upgrades since I've been on council in 2010. <laughs> so we're still talking about those. We're st still facing those and we're still figuring out how there, there will be a way forward. So, you know, Ah, things change, but they still stay the same a little bit. <laughs> the great pleasure of politics. Things always change, but they never truly yeah. do. Um, I, I've had a few of your fellow counselors on the show, and I've asked the apathy question to them a few times. But since you've been on council for 14 years, I think you bring a different perspective to this answer. But do you find that the people of Porters the Prairie are apathetic with when it comes to what's going on at City Hall. Uh, I, I hear when I speak to municipal leaders across Canada that traditionally municipal politics isn't the quote-unquote sexy politics, like provincial or even federal politics. In your time in office, have you seen an apathetic nature of what's go of, from the residents on what's going on at City Hall? Uh, no. No. I've seen a lack of understanding in some cases oh. about what levels of government are responsible for. But I will say that of all of the levels of government and all of the elections that come and go, I think our community takes the most keen interest in municipal politics. We see uh, huge full rooms when we are doing our uh, election forums and debates. They are really truly paying attention to what's coming up what people are doing when it comes to municipal and i've seen on the flip side of that i've seen empty rooms when it's come up with provincial or federal elections people have their decision made their minds made up and you know in some cases i would almost say it's apathy towards those levels of government even though those are the ones that are mostly in the news unfortunately the fact of the matter is we we in Portage for many, many decades, we voted a certain way and it's based on a party and municipal politics is not that way. We are not party politics. You're voting for an individual and people really care about what you have to say. And they tend to pay a lot more attention to the decisions that get made that affect them directly on their tax bill. So people are willing to give you their feedback on issues that are presented in front of council, I'm assuming then, right? Uh, I think they're very comfortable, some more than others, of course. And we so get a lot of stuff on, we get, <laughs> we get many, many uh, comments online. We get stopped in the public, we get stopped at the grocery store and people really want to know. And in some cases they genuinely want to know, they, they have an opinion, but their opinion can be swayed when they find out the rationale for a decision that we've made. Over those 14 years, you've probably had to make some very hard choices at City Hall, whether it be infrastructure funding, spending on certain areas in your community. How do you do that? How do you ensure, as you as a councillor, because you are one vote on that council, because you have to have a majority on council to pass anything, but you're one vote that impacts the day-to-day -day lives of people. How do you ensure and what metrics do you put in place for yourself to ensure that the decisions you're making are going to impact mm -hmm. the community in a positive manner, but realizing at the same time that the decisions you make are not going to be 100% agreed upon in the community? Well, you have to basically use um, use your checks and balances, but you're also your own value system to decide what you think is best for the community and the public has put their trust in you to do that. So every situation is going to be a little bit different and you have to consider, um, you know, 
an elderly couple that's scraping by on a retirement controlled income at the same time as you would the um you know the upper middle class that probably won't notice the forty dollars on their property tax bill so it's it's there's lots of different balances and lots of approaches and I think one of the things that um I hold in high regard is that I've lived in every area of this city. I've lived in all the different neighborhoods. I, I've friends and family that um, are from all walks of life. And I get very different perspectives wherever I am, wherever I go. And uh, you have to take them all into account. Do you have to take in the opposite side of an issue as well when you're uh, looking at individual issues? Because we we find ourselves in social economic echo chambers these days, whether it be through social media, whether it be through friends that you deal with on a day-to-day basis or family members, how important is it for you to to listen to both sides of an issue? Because you might come to a conclusion that you didn't think of prior when you're listening to someone who may disagree with the decision you're about to make. Well, that's extremely important. And, you know, decisions get made by people who show up. So somebody will say council has already made this decision. Well, we may have an opinion on which way we're leaning because you get a report a week ahead of time, you read the report, that's the information you have. So now you have an opinion based on this small chunk of information. Well, if nobody shows up to present a counterpoint or you cannot find a counterpoint or they just keep it to themselves, well, that's what your decision is based on. So you, you encourage people to speak up, you encourage people to say things to you. The one thing I would say is like, Facebook is not the appropriate venue to give your, like, whoa, I may whoa, never whoa, see whoa, that. Whoa, whoa, Breaking news here. Breaking <laughs> news. Counselor says Facebook is not the appropriate place. <laughs> yeah. Well, hey, people's right to complain and to protest. You can do it wherever you feel is necessary, wherever you want. And I say, have a, do what you feel you need to do and do what makes, you know, it's your right. But if you truly want to make a difference, there's only one way to guarantee that we are hearing your point of view, and that's by actually communicating with us directly. So uh, jumping off on that for a second here, for, uh, because Let's go. T- 2010, <laughs> you did not, social media was not the name of the game when it came to interactions, but more and more people are dealing with social media, whether it be X, Facebook, threads, or whatever social... TikTok, which I do not understand, and I feel really old saying that, but here we are in 2024. How do you get people to engage with you when their form of engagement is social media? Because we we jokingly say Facebook is not the place where you want to engage, but don't don't you as a counselor have a responsibility to go to places where people are engaging for that feedback? 100%. You meet people where they're at. So if it's something that is contentious, you know, we always have been a council that has made efforts. In fact, there's been periods of time over the past uh, 14 years where we've made real efforts to actually change the way we do things. We've had meetings off site, so they're more accessible. We've had many town hall meetings. Um, I don't want to say question period, but we did have a question period for a time and it went to the wayside because it wasn't used uh, what it, for what it was intended for. And, you know, we'll be out there in the streets, we'll be in the coffee shops, we'll be talking to people. And as much as we say that 2010, there wasn't social media, the fact is there was. And there were still people that had strong opinions and were posting them on Facebook. I had a couple of incidents where, you know, I'd the council had made a decision and um, I made the mistake of going into a, a strange uh, Facebook page and... Uh-oh. Uh, I see where this story is going already. And I kind of got dogpiled and it was a good opportunity and a good learning experience for me that maybe I should um, be a little more cautious when I'm going out there and trying to, uh, you know, defend a position on social media where there's no real checks and balances or accountability for anyone that, you know, wants to say whatever they can say with really no repercussions for that. You talked you talked a little bit earlier about uh, sort of the understanding of the jurisdictional purview of what the municipality deals with and the issues that the municipalities are dealing with when people are approaching you or talking about the issues that are going on. How often are you finding that people are approaching you on issues that 
traditionally aren't in the municipal jurisdiction. And how do you as a counselor tell people that it's not your responsibility without saying to them, it's not your responsibility because they're approaching you for a reason. They probably don't sure. know their MLA or their MP as quite as well as they know you as a counselor. So how do you tell people that it's not your issue to fix, but do it in a way that it's not trying to brush it off and tell people it's just, you're, you're barking up the wrong tree a little bit. Yeah, that comes up, you know, fairly often. It can be something as simple as we have the Trans Canada Highway running right down Saskatchewan Avenue, right through Portage. So that's obviously not 100% municipal jurisdiction. Um, we have highways that run through the city. We have the Tupper Overpass, which is actually the 240 Highway. The, the main thing is when somebody comes to you, you don't just say it's not my problem. You kind of, you say, you know, this is actually the responsibility of this organization. I can help you communicate with them or I can link you to resources. I think the most important thing is that they leave you uh, that conversation or that interaction feeling respected and, and that you were helpful to them in some way. Because just because it's someone else that writes the check for that particular area of snow clearing or road repair doesn't mean we don't have a responsibility to uh, help our citizens figure it out. I want to turn to the city of Portage the Prairie as a whole now, because I think we're going to talk a lot about some of the issues that we've already talked about briefly here for a few seconds. Um, but before I do, as I always do on the show, this is a conversation between the councillor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not even a policy of council. This is the councillor's opinion and his opinion alone. I don't know why, but I still get emails after saying that, but he's God bless our great people of Canada. So, I've had a few of your council, or council colleagues on this show, and they've all talked about their individual portfolios that they chair. Now, you are the chair of the Community Services Committee in Portage the Prairie, so hopefully you're okay with talking about community services for a few minutes. So I've got to ask this question. What is the state of the Community Services Department within the City of Portage the Prairie today? Well, this is an interesting question because there's a, a I, I have the advantage of being around long enough to know the history and how this was actually formed because a community services committee kind of didn't exist for a certain period of time in Portage La Prairie until it was one city manager ago and a couple of councils ago that in, we rolled this into the PCRC. So the Portage La Prairie Community Revitalization Corporation who plays a pivotal role in all things, kind of um, neighborhood renewal, homelessness programs, newcomer services, uh, we started providing core funding and invited them to the table and they kind of became our community services department. And that organization started with two staff in the basement of a building. Now they own the building. I think they've got upwards of 25 staff and they are a juggernaut who just has become such an important part of our community. Aside from just the PCRC, there's things like the Portage La Prairie Parks Committee. But to, I mean, to I digress a little bit to answer your question, the, the Community Services Committee is incredibly he healthy in our community. We have great staff and um, they're doing an amazing job. I've been around the block a long time as well, dealing with a lot of municipal issues, whether it be covering municipal issues or dealing with municipal ad administrations through administration. I know that community services is usually the one department that is always under the knife when it comes to budget times, especially during economic hardships, because that is the place where services are provided or services can be added so that way they can help the community members we are going through a very tough moment in the Canadian economy right now. Things are getting more expensive. Things are being just, things are just costing a lot more than they were 10, two years ago, heck, even a year ago. Looking at the, the services that you provide to the community, have you had to have those tough decisions to say, where do we need to potentially cut, scale back, or add to? when it gives services to our community, whether through 
parks, whether through your homelessness, whether through uh, the arena services library, have you had those tough decisions in this last year and a half? Uh, you know, community services has not been, for lack of a better word uh, or better phrase, on the chopping block. You know, I don't think because we have actually seen incredible value provided and I don't recall a counselor over any of my terms where the PCRC was involved state that um, this is an option where we can cut some costs and if not it's the opposite we need to actually well I'll give you some context to this so my wife was one of the um, uh, employees at the Porch Community Revitalization Corporation so without me being in the room on the last term I was on I was, uh, when she got the job as executive director, well, I was community services chair and had to step down and go back to, I think I was in transportation after that. So I had to leave that because it was an obvious conflict, but also during budget deliberations with the last council, they did a long-term funding agreement with the PCRC. So that's how committed we are to that, uh, to that group and to our community services department. Um, of course, there's lots of things that fall into that, the library being one of them. We have, uh, I don't believe there's ever been a real consideration for any serious funding removal of that. That's actually a partnership organization with the RM as well. It's a regional library. There's things like the Parks Committee who are, are almost self-sufficient. There are some city resources allocated, but that was a community group that I helped form um 11 years ago so we could start working towards equity in how green spaces and parks were spread throughout the community and they kind of have done their own fundraising over the years and um, have done one of the largest outdoor park projects in city history with private funds so really there's a lot of these things like we're thriving in that department i would say and it's not uh it's not something that i would ever you would never be able to convince me like protective services. There's any reason or any rationale that we would find anything good out of cutting those departments in any way. Now I was recently in Portage Prairie last summer and I'm actually going to be there in as of this airing four days, because after the AMM conference in Brandon, I'm coming to Portage the Prairie for a few days to visit because I've promised that if you come on the show, I will come to your community. Now, I know parks is a big thing for Portage the Prairie. Your Crescent Moon Park is probably one of the best that I saw when I was on my trips through Western Canada last summer. Um, do residents utilize the park system as much as you think they should? Or do, 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 you, do you get a sense that people are chanting for more parks in your community because i i when i was there and it was the middle of a saturday morning and people were utilizing the park and the trail system like i had never seen before are your parks being inundated with people just wanting more or is there a sense that we have enough i think there's neither i think there's i don't i think they could use them more and i but uh, they're well used yeah <laughs> people could use them more very friendly people as well. I'm just putting that, that out there. It, uh, <laughs> to say that it's enough, I don't think anyone would say that's enough. We have enough of this stuff. Um, but also there's not a huge outcry for more. But there's there's reasons for that because we in the parks, like the parks committee with the city have created new parks over the last 10 years. We've uh, upgraded parks. We've created kind of an old school, gone back to an old school way of thinking with outdoor rinks giving kids things to do in their neighborhoods, spreading it throughout the community. So there's equal opportunity without having to travel too far or have those obstacles of um, geography. So to say that there's a free skate at the, uh, at stride place at the Island. Well, that you got, you got to realize that sometimes people that's an obstacle. There's, they can't access it. What's affordable and accessible for one family might not be for the next. So we've gone to great lengths. One of the things I'm most proud of in this community is the outdoor rinks. And as simple as that was, that started with a, a small group of us. And I say us because I was one of them actually sticking rink boards on a tennis court and, and flooding a rink ourselves. In fact, to convince the council of the day that this was going to be utilized, um, the fire chief and I went out with a fire truck because... 
you know, we couldn't take firefighters out of their job at the fire hall. And I stood on the ice or stood on the, the cement with the fire hose and flooded the rinks. Well, he worked the, the pump. Like it was these kind of grassroots things just to prove, you know, viability of this stuff. And I think it's had a great impact. So we went from one to, I believe uh, we're up to six, five or six outdoor rinks now throughout the community. One of the things I'm most proud of and that uh, continues to expand is the active transportation paths. And I didn't play a direct role in that other than, you know, voting on some funding for it. But that's one of the things that's utilized the most. And I think it's grown community because now people are out doing things. They're seeing each other. They're having conversations on the path. And some of the most valuable conversations I've had with our citizens has been out just walking around next to the lake. What's in store for the community services department for Portage the Prairie? Because municipalities always have to look to the future because you're, you're here now, but you're always trying to aim for better or bring in new things or change things to make it easier for people to access. Yeah. Is there anything on the long-term or long-term or short-term long-term uh, forecast for the community services uh, department and committee in Portage the Prairie over the next year, five years, 10 years? Well, if I talk about the PCRC directly, I mean, uh, honestly, we provide core funding, but they've gone out and they found money that eclipses that several times over to run their programs. So I think uh, the future is bright for them because they're taking on every now they're taking on affordable housing. Like there's even home buyer programs that are administered by the PCRC. They've built a building with uh, higher levels of government grant money to uh, provide affordable housing to people. So it's, they're far too valuable to the community for, um, for us to not make them, you know, front and center. You must, and I say you as the Royal, you as Portage the Prairie and council, you must be so happy that you have an organization like the PCRC, uh, PCRC, I'm going to get that acronym right here, that you have an organization like this in your community because I, I've spoken to many municipal leaders across Manitoba and even across Canada who would chomp at the idea of having an organization like this. We're in a very good position. Um, neighborhood Renewal Corporations across the province did take a bit of a hit from other levels of government and past, uh, past budgets. Portage was not one of them. Well, Portage did, you know, that's why we provide some core funding to them. That's one of the reasons for that, but uh, we uh, were firmly behind them. And there's, you know, to think about where the community was when I started in 2010 to where they are now on the surface, people may not realize the differences, but I mean, there was a time when we were debating on closing down our full-time fire department and had to actually negotiate that um, between us and the RM, come up with an agreement to keep that going. Now it's something that people wouldn't even believe if you said it. <laughs> yeah so when you firefighters... said that i was a little taken back by that because... yeah there was firefighters that were there at the time and remember that and uh i said it during the last election period like looking back and uh a couple of the new firefighters said is that true did that really happen they asked some of the older firefighters and they're like yeah that happened that was a real thing <laughs> We talk we talk about community services here for about 15 minutes, but I've got to ask, what do you see as the state of Portage the Prairie today as a whole, not just in the community services department and committee, but as a whole, looking back on the last 14 years, is it a different community when you first got elected to where you are today? Uh, fundamentally, it's very similar. It's growing. Um families are changing the outcome i look at family but that's across canada that's not just in our community you know the one of the criticisms of portage in the past is that we are, our population has been stagnant but we're starting to see the actual real growth um housing is being developed industry is coming we've seen you know i think 1.6 billion dollars in the last uh, like five or six years between simplot and roquette there's so many things happening and so many bright possibilities and for the first time in uh, my entire time on council, I am at a highest, my highest level of confidence, I'll say, that I've ever been, that we have all the right people in place to move forward and prosper in just about every area that you can. 
How do you balance, and I say you as a counselor now, not as counsel, but how do you balance the needs of the community with the needs of the individual? Because I can imagine after 14 years, you realize that people are going to come up to you with their very own unique micro issues, whether that be potholes, whether that be uh, parks, whether that be service levels. But you, at the end of the day, realize that you'll have a certain amount of money that you can spend uh, in a given year. These municipalities cannot run deficits. So you have to balance the needs of the community with the needs of the individual. How do you do that to ensure that people feel like they're getting their fair share of property taxes that they pay back to them in the services that they require? Yeah, yeah. And uh, it's been a long time since I've seen Wrath of Khan, so I'm not going to do that quote or try to butcher it. However, <laughs> the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few or the one, Kirk. Oh, God, yeah. thank God for someone else, some other nerd here. For... So it's an interesting question. I mean, the, the overall needs of the community are are paramount. But I also think it's important to hear the individual and sometimes that's all they're looking for is to be heard and validated that, yeah, okay, there's something there. So if it's something as simple as a pothole at the end of their driveway, you know, sometimes we can take care of that. If it's something like on a grand scale where somebody feels they have a need that's, you know, costs thousands and thousands of dollars, then we have to take another look at that. But it doesn't cost you a lot to send somebody by there to look into their, uh, their concern. Oftentimes, it's a, like when you get an individual call, it could be a pothole, it could be a road, it could be snow removal. And a lot of those times, they're valid. So you take a drive, you go have a look. And that's the one of the benefits of being in a small community is, you know, everything six minutes away. Go take a look. Go talk to them. Meet them where they're at. Um, have a conversation. See what they have to say. And, you know, take care of it. Help Be helpful if you can. And, uh you know, in some cases, it's linking to other resources. And in some cases, you know, it's just a no. <laughs> that's it, that's the it, toughest thing sometimes. Is it no or is it no with an explanation? Because it, I, I can imagine the hardest thing that you could ever say to someone as an elected official, because you get elected, you know, you have to run potentially run for re-election in four years. If you say no to enough people, they're not going to vote for you. So how? Well, I'll give you a real no life. Okay. I'll give you a real life example. So a citizen had come forward at one point and um, did not like the way that an organization was running things, and asked us to force them to change uh, because we were one of their primary funders. And that was uh, that was a no. It had an explanation, but it was definitely a no. That is not what we're here for. And um, they actually asked the question, like, tell them you're pulling your funding if they don't change. That would be like me trying to show up at, uh, you know, the city garage and start doing all the work they're doing, right? So there's a rationale that this organization followed to make the changes that they made. And only one person did not like it. And they had their reasons for that. And um, the board that was, they were governed by a board and said, this is the change we're making. Here's why. And then of course they went to the next step and went to the funders and tried to do that. And for us, the answer is no. And if that person decides, you know, we're not voting again for you based on that. Well, I'm okay with that because it wasn't the right thing to do. And just because you're sponsoring somebody doesn't mean you micromanage them. A, I agree wholeheartedly <laughs> with that. B, I'm like shivering inside, trying not to scream at my top of my lungs about what that transpired. But I, I hear that all the time. It's not something that's unique to uh, the the city of Portage the Prairie. Um, do you find yourself balancing those requests more often? Because we've we've become a sort of a individual com uh, country where everyone's about me and everyone's about the, the 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 singularity a little bit when people do approach you are you getting a sense that more people are coming together to address certain issues as a group rather than an individual or are you seeing sort of that balance where one person might be upset with the way an organization is running like you just said in that example so they want change are you seeing that the group a group is getting together because they understand that uh numbers are better than just an individual 
No, I, I honestly not. Like if there's, you know, obviously crime is an issue that everyone cares about. So you'll see a large, you know, group of people show up if there's an opportunity to have a dip, make a difference in that. But there's some of those issues like the one I just mentioned. There's other ones where people have a certain thing they want and they, they can't get the public behind them because the public doesn't see it as important. And, you know, that's becoming obvious in some cases. And, you know, I've been around for quite a while. People know me. I know them. They know what to expect when they approach me. And in some time, in some cases, they're going to hear it uh, that, you know, I, I don't agree. I'll respect you enough to give you a response whether it's an email or whatever. And I'll say, no, I don't agree with that. And um, you feel free to run it past the rest of the council on just one note. And sometimes that's just a no. And you know what? I, I feel pretty confident that I haven't lost any voters because of that. I think that they actually respect the fact that I give them a response and will say no and comfortably say no. And there's been many times in council and in other organizations, just yesterday, I was on the other side of a vote where I was the only person opposed to something. And you know, that happens. Sometimes it's popular, sometimes it's not. And uh, I, I try to stay genuine to who I am as a person and uh, okay. what I feel is right. So you just cracked open a, question, a line of question that I need to jump down here. Give her. You got, got 10 <laughs> minutes. Because we have listeners across this country who tune into the show, who are potentially looking to run for council or potentially are on council, who are in the position that you just talked about last night's vote. Now, Council's not going to agree, as the community is never going to agree 100% on 100% of the issues. Council is never going to agree on 100% of the issues 100% of the time. How important is it for a person like yourself, like a councillor, a newly elected councillor, whether you've been in office for one term, one month, or four terms like yourself, to stay true to that value, to say, you know what, as much as the winds look like they're going one way, I still hold it true to my heart, into my values, that I need to stand up and make to make sure people know that I'm voting against something or voting for something, even though it may not go against the majority view on council. I think it's incredibly important to be authentic to who you are. And if you're not, people will figure that out. Um, <laughs> they will. They, they, they have that detector, this, you know, but I think it's important to be true to who you are. And if you don't agree with something, the people elected you, because they trust your opinion. And if you're just going to go with the majority, that's not the right move either. Now, not to say that anyone that votes, if it's an overwhelming majority of something is just going with the majority, that might be actually how they feel. But um, I'll give you a real world example of something that I fought really hard for. And it was actually municipal funding for um, city parks way back in my first term. And I was on an island and we had the parks committee or what was called the North End Parks Committee of the day show up uh, and do a presentation and put a lot of pressure on council. And still um, the answer was no. And I was the one that voted, uh, only one who voted in. I made a motion. It was seconded because, you know, there's colleagues on there that will second something, not necessarily intending to vote in favor of it. And uh, I was I was voted down soundly. One vote two, six. On the flip side of that question, though, is there has to be a respect around that council table that the different opinions that are voted upon have what happens at council stays at council. And the moment that council ends and the meeting is adjourned, you go back to being just average residents and people who are taxpayers as well. Uh, do you still have to find the that mutual respect to uh, to understand that people may have different opinions that if your decide doesn't win you can't go away angry that it didn't win and you have to respect the decision of the majority of council yeah that's incredibly important so you don't you know we've heard the horror stories of you know the counselor that doesn't get his way and he goes and he talks about it in the media you don't want to be that you don't want to be that guy if you are on a side of a vote you can say why you're on that side of the vote, but you also have to say, you know, now that the decision is made, I support the decision and we move forward. That's once it's done, it's done. You move on and you show respect to your colleagues. You show respect to the people that agree or disagree with you. And um, I think every council is that respect earned or is that 
guaranteed when you first get elected because there might be people who say you know what i'm go- i'm going i'm going to get elected and i feel like we've gone down a rabbit hole here and i love it i pure i apologize I love it. right let's now let's go um, yeah um, there might be people who say i'm going to get elected on one issue and i think i that is the most important issue that i'm going to get elected on and you've probably seen candidates come and go who have just ran on one issue some might have gotten elected some might you might see other municipalities um How is respect earned in the job or do you get it thrust upon you when you were first elected? Because the council that you have in Portage of the Prairie today, I, and I say this not blowing smoke up to anyone here, is probably the most well-oiled council that I have seen in my time covering municipal politics and doing this show. But it doesn't seem like it got there in the first day. It seems like it's grown into this well-oiled machine does the respect come with the job or do you have to work at, at that respect? I think it's, um, oh, this is an interesting question because you mentioned the one issue counselors. I don't think we have any of those that were elected. Um, but, normally but they the outside don't. of Portage the Prairie, there is. Yeah. And I say yeah. that respect, no way. Now I won't say, I would say that you pretty much, in, in my opinion, you enter the job with respect i would say that it is your job to maintain that <laughs> throughout the process not that you will ever be shown disrespect but you know i appreciate other opinions and there are many around our council table and i feel like we're all very comfortable expressing our opinions and com- like we will not be shy about telling you how we feel I wouldn't want to be part of a council where you have two or three members that just put their hand up without ever saying why. Are you, are you willing to ask the stupid questions from time to time? A hundred percent. And I feel like I've had to rephrase a question about six or seven times at times to get to where I think I need to be to make a decision. And it frustrates some people <laughs> sometimes, but that's part of the job. That's part of what we do. And if you don't understand what you're voting on, like ask the question and, and get into the weeds a little bit if you have to. I appreciate your candor on that, but I want, I'm going to turn back to the city for a second before we move yeah. to tourism, because I'm cautious of time here and we're almost at the 40 minute mark and I haven't even gotten to my last segment. What does Portage the Prairie get right in your mind? What is the thing that when you talk to other municipal leaders, when you talk to your residents about what the city is doing right for the community, what is that thing? What is that quantitative thing that you talk about that you boast about when it comes to port the city? Well, there's two parts to that question because the first half of that question, I had an answer that was I was absolutely confident with. The second part, I'm going to answer that a little separately. Yeah. So the one thing that we get right as a council is that we understand that we don't need to see how the sausage is made. We don't need to micromanage. We know we have one staff member that we contact with our concerns. And with his blessing, we may talk to you know other department heads or whoever because that's just kind of the way it does. We maintain a, the way it is, we maintain a respectful relationship with these other uh, with him and with the rest of the people that work for the city. We get that right. We do not go out and buy the grader or the fire truck on our own and come back with the dealership jacket, you know, as a counselor. We're the ones that are, you know, we understand who runs the city. And then we have one staff member and we each have one vote. And collectively, unless there's three more of us that agree, you know, there's nothing much to be done. Now, the second Nathan, part, what do we... Your city manager is now signing a big... Big relief right now after you <laughs> said those comments. Nathan's probably sitting in his office going, oh, thank God he said that. I don't think he would actually be surprised to me saying that at all. I think he knows, like, we all know we have a great relationship. He knows where we stand. And um, he's never had to tell us that. That's just something, you know, You know, I've reiterated it several times. I've been part of other uh, groups that are made up of municipal officials that aren't with the city of Portage La Prairie. And I, you know, I had to remind them at times, you know, we got this one person that's in charge of this organization and that's who we go through. We do not need to go test drive a truck, you know, and decide that's the one. It's not our job. 
Um, so I think we get that right all day long. Uh, as far as the rest of it goes, you know, I am super happy and the, the council is in such a good place that we are good stewards of money. We are taking into account the needs of the entire community um, and working towards a brighter future for everybody and trying to tackle the issues that maybe aren't even part of a direct responsibility of a municipality, but working with our partners to try to help in, in ways that we can. So um, even dealing with things like uh, homelessness and addiction and mental health stuff where, you know, our resources may go outside the community to to deal with those kind of things and be helpful with those kind of things. I think we're open more to um, partnerships and we can illustrate that a lot with the tax sharing agreement that we've had with the rural municipality for uh, over a decade. Uh, I want to turn to the tourism for a second. And Let's I am pretty, pretty much sure that I have gotten every single counselor to give me some different type of answer when it comes to tourism. So I'm going to hold this and I'm going to say, hopefully you'll give me some of your hidden gems that you like to promote when you are in, uh, when you have the tourists coming to Portage the Prairie. But what are the tourist destinations that you tell people to go see in Portage the Prairie? So, you know, the obvious answer is the lake. And I'm not going to hang on that one, but I will tell you why. It's because when a lot of people come through Portage, they never see it. And I've heard it said so many times, like I, I work in real estate, so I show people around the community. And when I get to the lake, dozens and dozens of times I've heard, wow, I didn't know this was here. And then there's all the things that come with it. There's the walking paths, there's Stride Place, there's Island Park, there's all those things. So that's the obvious one. Splash Island's over there. Um, I would send people up to Simplot Central Park because that's a personal one for me that uh, the Parks Committee has um, gone to great lengths. And within, if you can believe this, within Simplot Central Park is McCain Interactive Fountain. So we have two industries, two juggernauts in the industry that have collaborated to help make that a reality. Okay, you have to explain what this is <laughs> all about because I have not heard anything about this fountain. So what 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 where is this and how can I see this when I come to Portage La Prairie in two weeks? <laughs> well, you want to go north over the Skyline Bridge, which most people refer to as the Tupper Street Overpass or just the Overpass. And if you look off to your left, you'll see the old arena, which is still an arena, the BDO uh, arena. You take a left and you go up to 3rd Street Northwest and you will see Simplot Central Park. And there's an interactive fountain, an accessible playground, a new skate park. And we're in the process of finishing up uh, the last touches, which is a, a walking path, some landscaping, and potentially a washroom facility there at some point. Yeah. I can't wait to see it. Where do you go in the and, community? Uh, Oko had continued, sorry. Yeah, the other one I'll mention uh, is the Residential School Museum, which I know that's been mentioned on the show before, but that's um, actually on um, at the Kishkimakwa, next to the Kishkimakwa Gaming Center. That's something that should be visited as well. It is one of the stops that I want and I'm going to make sure I get to when I'm in Portage to the Prairie. Um, but where do you go? After a stressful day of council meetings, after a long day of budget deliberations, which I know every municipal leader loves to sit in a room with six, seven other people and their council colleagues yeah. and their committee and their administration, is there a spot in the community where you can go and just decompress after a long day and just recenter yourself knowing that tomorrow morning you're going to have to get up and do the exact same thing over again and make your community better off than you left it the day before? You know, that's an interesting question because most people would, you know, come up with something uh, that they want to do, but I just want to go home to my family, man. That's all I want to do. <laughs> Every municipal leader that I've chatted to truly wants to say that, and they all, about 90% have said it. <laughs> but I mean, if I were to pick something that I utilize the most, I'm on those paths all the time. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'll am i ride my bike out to the junkyard dogs uh, bike trails. I'll go around the perimeter with it, come back on the on the active transportation paths along the lake. I'll boot around Island Park for a little while. 
you know, that's, that's kind of the thing, you know, there's lots of restaurants and, and stuff that I hang around at, or, you know, it's, uh, there's lots of things to do, lots of different places. I, unlike, you know, a lot of other people, I've been here all pretty much my whole life since I was three years old. And, um, where are you originally where from? I was born in Thunder Bay, but I moved here when I was three and uh, I've been here ever since. I travel a lot for other various reasons, but you know, Portage is home. I keep coming back. And I remember, I remember watching The Empire Strikes Back in the same movie theater that's here today. <laughs> so it brings me to the final question. And it's the million dollar question to end all the interviews. And it's a question I've asked every single person who's come on. So you're no exception because I like to hear what makes their community such unique in their own eyes. So in your opinion, why is the city of Portage La Prairie such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family, Councillor? Uh, for me, it's, you know, there's the the things we can say about the small town uh, charm, big city amenities. It's more than that. It's familiarity. It's community. It's the people. It's, um, you know, I have seen a lot of the world and I've seen a lot of the world because of, you know, my sporting endeavors. I get to go and travel around and see many countries and obscure places that most people wouldn't get to go. But uh, coming home to Portage just gives me a sense of comfort and knowing that um, there's no area in here that I'm uncomfortable in. And I know a ton of people, but it's big enough too that, you know, you might not see somebody for 10 years in your own community. Like that happens. So it's, uh, for me, it's the right size. It's the right distance to amenities. It's the right distance to a big center. And um, it's affordable living. And uh, Portage is just home. Portage is just home. Best way I could ever end an interview off in my life, if you ask me. Um, Ryan, I want to I, I want to thank you so much for sitting down doing this. Uh, it seems like Portage La Prairie is my second home with all the interviews that I've been doing with it, but it it, it really left a mark on me when I was driving through uh, last August, and I can tell you, I I've never looked forward more to go visit a community again, and I'm excited to come back to Portage La Prairie in April, which is right after the AMM conference in Brandon. So hopefully if you're not at in the the spring conference for AMM, we will might be able to grab a coffee when I come through Portage La Prairie that following weekend. I would love that and I will uh I'll give you my version of the city tour. There you go. There you go. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks so much Ryan. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you for tuning in for another great episode. Now, if today's episode did spark your interest, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all the diverse content covering everything from the affairs that municipalities are dealing with on Municipal Affairs to our in-depth cross-border interview where we sit down with municipal leaders from across Canada and even our eye-opening exploration on the decisions local governments make in the political trenches, local government at work. We are your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage committed to keeping you well-informed as well as engaged on the issues. Your support is the backbone of our growth and the maintenance of this top-notch content you have come to enjoy over the last few years.